and, and, and thanks for, for, for welcoming me here. It's, it's quite an honor to be here among the greats of, of, um, of altitude training, altitude adaptation. Uh, I will have to disappoint you a little bit because um, although I've been asked to talk about the medical aspects of altitude training, um, there's no way I can, can match uh, the speakers of yesterday presenting nice study, nice data that have gathered themselves. I'm unable to do that and I'm going to be completely off topic as well. Um, because um, I realized there was quite a big debate um, going on yesterday about different aspects of, of, of altitude adaptation, altitude training. And then I looked at the crowds and many of you, I mean the first two rows, you're all researchers, you've all been to altitude, you've done a lot of studies, you know, magnetic stimulation, taking blood, all these things, but the rest of the crowds, they haven't done that. So, um, so I'm going to go a little bit back to the basics to, to, to help these guys out to see what's actually happening at altitude and then we're going to develop a little bit um, the, the adaptations and the medical aspects from that. So first I'm going to talk a bit about the basics of adaptation to hypoxia, the physics and the physiology and adding to our debate from yesterday um, about the hemoglobin mass adaptation, the respiratory adaptation, all these things that we've seen. Uh, I'm going to have a little look at a comparative physiology and then, of course, we're going to speak about uh, altitude-related health issues, which you will see, of course, stem from all these adaptations or, yes, and all, all these adaptations, maybe wrong going adaptations. Now, um, from altitude, just from the physics, remember from, from school, what's happening is alt at altitude is less atmospheric pressure. Everybody knows that, you know, Qatar is somewhere down here, so nowhere near the other altitude uh, venues in the world. And given that there's less pressure, um, the amount of oxygen per volume is lower. So this obviously is a challenge uh, for the organism. And the challenge for the organism is actually the driving force. The driving force from the oxygen to the tissue, this is basically what makes us breathing, what makes our cells function, that's lacking or that's much less than, than, than usual. And that's the problem in all adaptation and problems when it comes to hypoxia. This is what we see. Here you have the partial pressure of, of oxygen and here you have the time your red blood cell flows across your capillary and has the time to take up the oxygen. And this is the saturation that you see. One at sea level and the, the green one here at altitude. So you can see that from the, ins the inspired air, the partial pressure of the inspired air, already at the alveolar level, level in your lung, there's a little bit less of oxygen. And then obviously in the venous, mixed venous blood that comes to be reoxygenated from your, from your system, there's even less. And so this is basically the driving force or the gradient that basically pushes your oxygen to your red cell at sea level. And this is what it is at extreme altitude. So you see that this driving force is much less at altitude and it takes the red cell much longer to be loaded with oxygen. So whereas at sea level it will be done in less than about 0.2 seconds, it takes almost a second at altitude. Needless to say that this is difficult to the body to cope with and needs adaptations on different organ systems. So we're going to look at some of these organ systems, some of the adaptations of, on these organ systems, namely the lungs, the heart, the red blood cells, or the blood cell system, and the muscle. Now, um, the lung is probably what you notice first when you go to altitude. Many of you have been skiing. You know, and the first thing that you notice at altitude that the breathing is a bit more difficult. You know, you need to, be, to breathe faster. You know, so there's something happening with the breathing. And depending on the duration of the altitude, uh, of your altitude stay and the elevation, your ventilation will obviously go up, you know, by quite a big amount. And this is not coming back down as you adapt it, but it stays like that even if you stayed at altitude over months. Not very surprising uh, changes here. You, you probably all knew that before. So there's a short-term and more long-term adaptation of the ventilation. We're going to come back to that a little bit later in the talk. Same for the heart rate. You know, obviously, the red blood cells need to flow across the capillary. There's the oxygen loading is a bit more difficult, so the heart rate needs to go up to improve the perfusion of the, of the areas um, as a reaction to the hypoxia. So usually what you see is twofold. Um, the heart rate at rest will go up 
It will settle a little bit later on uh, as you stay longer. But also the heart rate at exhaustion will drop a little bit. So the range of heart rate that you have at your, <coughs> at your disposal for exercises altitude is reduced with a higher basal or resting heart rate and a reduced exercise heart rate at, at exhaustion. Um, stroke volume. Rob Chapman talked about it yesterday um, and he showed some nice data that he basically derived from, from, from Walter's um, um, data. And this is basically mirroring the fact that the stroke volume in the beginning drops. Now, why is that? That's as, it's all, as all these um, uh, um, adaptation processes, they're not independent. You have to see them in connection one to another. Now, the stroke volume probably drops because of the reduced filling pressures of the heart. There's less blood coming back to the heart from the lungs because in the lung, the pulmonary pressures are increased because of some reflexes in the lung that redirect the blood to areas where there's enough, enough oxygen. So as there's not much oxygen in the air anyways, so many of the blood vessels in the lung will contract. It will increase the pulmonary pressure. There's less blood flowing through the lung. This will decrease the, um, the stroke volume. I think this is just a, an example to show you that all the different systems are connected. And when thinking about the adaptation and all the adaptation to altitude training in team sports and endurance sports, we always have to remember that, that we cannot see the systems independent one of another. Right? So this comes all back, uh, all back to normal when uh, the blood volume is, is, re uh, is, is recovered or is adapted to the, higher, to the higher altitudes and the respiratory response is, is in there. So this is a, basically a temporary adaptation. Um, as well, like in the lung, where through the euler liljestrand reflex, uh, the blood is directed to the areas where um, it's actually well oxygenated, um, the same happens in the tissue. So the blood flow to the active muscle tissue, where it's relevant to that, that is relevant to be oxygenated, is increased, whereas the blood flow to the non-active tissue is reduced. So a selective distribution of this, of this blood flow in the, in the human body, the human body tries to best use the resources that he has. HB mass, hemoglobin mass, red cell mass, we've discussed that extensively yesterday, so I'm not going to go into details. You all know that, or most of you will know and will acknowledge that it will increase. Um, however, it seems that this um, increase is depending on the degree of hypoxia, the duration of exposure, and, and this is, I think, the key point which where brings the, the two positions that we had yesterday, brings it together, is many other factors, individual factors, training factors, disease, injuries, all these things. This will make the difference where, why some people adapt and others don't. And I think we're going to hear some more from Rob Chapman later on on this point. Now, um, the muscle, does the muscle adapt to exercise? Um, we've heard some, some statements yesterday in the different talks. Um, there's still some debate. There's uh, the vascularization, we're not sure. We're not sure in the human being. There have been some, some animal experiments that, that, that show that it does, that there's more vascularization. It will make sense, you know, more blood, blood vessels around the muscle would, would bring more oxygen there. So it's maybe not a, not, not a bad thing to have. I'm going to come to back to that, uh, back to that in, a, in a minute. But also, um, this is, is an example of how science can be misinterpreted. Because for many years, people thought, OK, that's happening. You know, there's more vascularization. But all that data stemmed from one experiment with guinea pigs in, uh, in, um, in South America. And they had two groups of guinea pigs, one in Lima, which was more down, and one, one at 4,000 something meters. And they thought, okay, the ones that are at altitude, you know, they, they developed more capillaries in the muscles and the enzyme system was improved and all these things. But then actually they realized that the, the guinea pigs at sea level, they were held in cages, could move. And the one at altitude, they were running free like in a little yard, you know. So basically what they saw was a training adaptation. At the same time, in, others, in, in other studies with humans where they found the same thing, they realized that maybe the vascularization was increased because of the total muscle mass was decreased because of detraining. So the ratio of, of vessels to muscle uh, was increased. So it, it's, it's still being debated whether the vascularization is, is better or not. Um, the mitochondrial enzymes un, are probably unaltered or, or downregulated. We've seen it yesterday. Carson presented some data, and I think there's, there's 
constant on that, that there's not much happening with the enzymes. Um, however, there's some, some transport proteins for, for um, metabolites that are very, very relevant for exercise that are upregulated by carbonate and lactate. There's increased use of sugar for, for energy supply. Very simple, because if you use fats, for example, you need much more oxygen. You know? So this is basically a, a some more efficient way of getting energy. And, and this is more of a physiological thing, so most of the, the, the coaches and the, and the physiotherapists are here will not like that. You know, the 2,3-DPG, um, which is a substance which can change the affinity of oxygen, or of hemoglobin to oxygen. Um, is increased, and this will shift your, your uh, oxygen affinity curve to the right. Now, remember that it's going to shift to the right in the, in the acute altitude adaptation. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, this will make basically the, um, the hemoglobin less sticky for oxygen, so the oxygen can leave the hemoglobin easier in the periphery, you know, to go to the muscle. Now, how long, how long do these adaptations actually take? You know, and this, is, this is, goes so minutes, days, years, so, so there's, there's quite a range. So as you know, like heart rate, ventilation, um, they're pretty quick to adapt, as I showed you, you know, within minutes or hours or days, whereas others are kind of midterm uh, um, adaptations. Hemoglobin concentration, hemoglobin mass takes, we've seen yesterday, weeks or months to adapt. And then there are other, um, other factors that take years or maybe generations to that because there are some genetic changes induced by altitude exposure. And of course, it's a big question that we're asking, and it could give us some information on what to expect from altitude training. Um, as, as usual, you know, um, this problem has been dealt with before. There's hardly anything you, know, you don't find on internet you know, nowadays. You know, if you have a question, you go on internet, you find it. And um, obviously for this, there's no internet, but, but there's the nature. Nature had had that problem before. And there's many species, animal species, who have been exposed to altitude or to hypoxia on a short-term and a long-term basis. Um, and this leads to my question. What do you think um, in the animals that have been born and lived and bred for generations and generations and generations at altitude on hypoxia? Which of these um, issues is the correct one? Now, will they adapt through an increased red cell mass? Will they adapt through an adapted ventilation? Will they adapt to because their cardiac output is uh, increased and thereby the oxygenation is improved? Or will they adapt all, with all three um, arguments here, or all three possibilities? So who's, who thinks A is correct, or the first one is correct? Nobody thinks that, that animals have increased red cell mass. No, no, so nobody, nobody thinks A is correct. Oh, Hans is the only one. All right, okay. Adapted ventilation? Adapted cardiac output? Nobody? All the above? So you all think you're experts, right? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to see. You, you like this. Okay, so now let's look at these animals. So I, I choose two animals the llama, you know, and then the bar headed goose. Now, these two animals, the, the, the llama obviously lives at altitude. You know, all these things, basically, that's the landmark animal for, for altitude, lives in South America. And, and, and this one, actually, um, it's good because it's spread all over the world. And there are some of them, they live at altitude. They fly really high, as high as normal passenger uh, airplanes. But they also exist at sea level. So we have actually the good possibility in comparing um, the ones that have lived at altitude forever since I don't know how many generations and the ones that at w in one strain lived at altitude for many generations and other ones that lived at sea level at, at, at for many generations and have been brought up to altitude to see what the adaptation will be in these animals. Now, um, let's maybe start with bringing these ones, the ones that have, have, have uh, been at sea level, up to altitude. And what happens? They will increase their red cell mass. So that's, that's, that, that, that's for sure. Now, let's look at those who have lived at altitude for generations, for a long time. And this is the same than the llamas. You know, so they've lived there for many generations. And you'll be surprised that their hematocrit is really low. So that's quite a shock. You know? So the hematocrit in the human is about 40, 45, you know, so that's normal. And most animals, most animals, 
have hemoglobin values or hematocrit values which is uh, correlated around 15, you know, sea level animals, you know, around 15. It goes across all species. The, the reptiles have a bit less because they don't move that much, you know, but all birds, mammals, all around 15. 14.9, I think, is the overall average. Um, and interestingly, these two species who've been bred at, at, at altitude have an increased oxygen affinity. I just told you that the human being, by adapting, has a decreased oxygen affinity. No, they have an increased oxygen affinity. So it's a totally different way of adaptation. Now, of course, this alone won't make you, make you good at altitude because you have less red cells. Uh, the muscle here, and this is, I think, where one of the, one of the key issues is in long-term altitude adaptation for these animals, um, what um, happens in the muscle of these animals if they have been at gener for generations at altitude for a long time, uh, not the ones that go up to altitude because that's, not, that, that's an adaptation that's not happening in a short time, that's happening over generations, is that the diffusion difference or the diffusion distance is reduced between the vessels and the mitochondria because the oxygen needs to go from the vessels to the mitochondria in the cell. And here, the cells are placed, uh, the mitochondria are placed much closer to the vessels. Uh, so this adds to the first picture that I've shown you with the driving force of the diffusion capacity where we compare the sea level to the high altitude. The heart, it's a bit the same. You know, so there's, there's not much pulmonary hypertension, no much adaptation and cardiac output, nothing. The only thing that the muscle capitalization in a cardiac muscle is a bit improved. And this is about this, because the heart is a muscle, is very similar to the muscular adaptation. And interestingly, and this is, this is one of the biggest adaptations that we see in, in, in the animals, they have an increased diffusive conductance and thin-walled pulmonary vessels, again, the driving force is reduced, so they have to somehow adapt to this reduced driving force by improving or by facilitating the transport of the oxygen from the blood to the cell or to the red cell in the lung. So you see that these long-term altitude animals, they do not adapt through the red blood cell system. They adapt through other variables and mainly the lung, mainly the lung. Now, why is that? Why is that? If the hemoglobin value, if you make more red cells, your blood is going to be very viscous and not flow really nicely you know, to the vessels and need much more work from the heart and from the, from the lung you know, to get oxygenated, to get pumped through the, um, through the vessels. And that's probably one of the reasons that the efficiency of that adaptation is not really good. It's fast because you can make red cells pretty, pretty quickly. You, know, it's, it's, you, you go to hypoxia now, your retic's going to go up to, uh, in a couple of days. You know. So um, that's a fast way of adaptation, but in the long term, it's not a good adaptation, not a favorable adaptation. So nature has opted over generations more to these ones. Now that's, that's animals. Um, the question is, now the correct answer would be this one. Uh, so these ones are clearly not 100% not <coughs> correct. This is the most correct one. So you all got it wrong. Uh, now, we do see that in humans as well. Now, you, we have populations that have been at altitude for some, for some generations. You know, we have the ants and, and Tibet. Both have populations that have lived there for long. But, big difference, the ants have been populated about 11,000 years back, and Tibet has been populated about 25,000 years back. So there's a bit of a difference you know, between the ants and Tibet. And looking at the physiological adaptations of um, the, the people in the ants, here, the, those are the yellow ones, and Tibet, you will see that the hemoglobin content, concentration in the people in Tibet, so the, the ones that have been there much longer from generations than in the ants, is lower and it's almost normal to what you and, and I have here in, in Qatar. Huh? Whereas the ventilatory response, the resting ventilation, and that's much higher in the people in Tibet. So they adapted more through the lung than through the blood, whereas the people that were there shorter, the ones in, in the ants, they adapted more through the blood. So they're still, I think they're still in the process of de developing. Huh? Um, there's a third type of adaptation that has been described in Ethiopia, 
which is kind of a mixture between the two. So it's, there's much more to it than there's this. I'm a bit, a bit, bit uh, simplifying. Right, let's now turn back. I think this puts a bit into perspective the discussions we had yesterday between um, what's actually the right adaptation, what's happening, what's not happening, you know. So we, the animal nature has done it all before, you know, before we even thought about altitude training. You know? And of course, we cannot breed uh, athletes for altitude, you know, to have good altitude responders in a couple of generations, well-adapted ones, but I think that puts a bit of the framework. Now, um, let's look at some practical aspects and come back to the medical aspects of, uh, of altitude training, again, in our four different uh, organ systems that, that I've selected for this, for this talk. Um, the first one um, is uh, the lung. Uh -huh. Obviously, at, at altitude, uh, the temperature is lower and the humidity is reduced. You know, less oxygen can bind, le there's less water in the, in the air and the oxygen that's there. Um, and this will obviously cause stress on your respiratory system, um, which will increase the risk of upper, upper respiratory tract infections and induce or make exercise induce lung damage worse because this is a pattern mechanism for all this um, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction or exercise-induced asthma, as you know. It's supposed, the airways are supposed to dry out, you know, and cause a stimulus there. So, and this is heavily increased at altitude. So if you go to altitude, be aware that your athletes might be more prone to upper, upper respiratory tract infections and exercise-induced lung damage. Um, the autonomous nervous system, that's basically what regulates it all. And all the adaptations that we've seen are probably triggered by this system. Now, um, at altitude, it's a stress for your organism. Your sympathetic activity is going to be increased. And not only the heart rate that we have discussed uh, early on, but much more relevant for your athlete is the sleep quality and the, and, and the problem that it causes for sleeping. Uh, you'll have a reduction in sleep quality. Um, the type of sleep is gonna 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 uh, be different, but usually you adapt to it uh, over a certain time once you stay at altitude. There's a large inter individual variability. I remember when I was with teams at altitude, there were people that were not complaining at all about sleep, and others they simply could not sleep. Same level, same team, same training, and this obviously will heavily affect the recovery of your athletes. So it's something to uh, definitely definitely consider while you're planning an altitude camp. At the end of the talk, I'm just going to very briefly touch on the, the, the common uh, the medical problems, the altitude with acute mountain sickness, uh, hypoxia-induced altitude pulmonary edema, and the cerebral edema, because I don't think the latter two are so relevant for athletes because it's not happening at the altitudes that, that, that we talk about. One that is happening in athletes at the altitude we're talking about that many of you have probably uh, uh, have already seen is the acute mountain uh, sickness. It's a tricky one because it presents with all kind of odd symptoms that could have uh, many other causes, like headache, you know, gastrointestinal systems, fatigue, dizziness, you know, that you can have that when you train, you can have that when you ate something wrong, you get nausea, sleeping disorders, all these problems. And usually it occurs at altitudes 2,000, 2,500. I've seen it at 2,000 with athletes. And it occurs within usually between 6 and 12 hours of, of the acid. Again, it's highly individual, some people get it, some people don't. The pathophysiology is unclear. Big debate, I checked on internet if there's anything new about it since I, since I last looked it up a couple of years ago. No, nothing changed, still it's a mess. Nobody knows what, it, what causes it. Um, the therapy is easy, you know. Either you uh, let the people descend, usually to res if, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't resolve after three or four days, or you can give them some, some, uh, some medication, acetazolamide. This is actually a carboanhydrase inhibitor which mimics the effect of increased breathing at altitude because it will eliminate some acids and um, basically mimic um, the action of, of that natural adaptation. You have to start before you go to altitude anyways. So ma many climbers, they use it. Um, you can, to, 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 to make it easier for you to find out the acute mountain sickness, there's the so Lake Louise score system. So there's a couple of questions that you can go through with the athletes. It's pretty quick, you know, and then it gives you a scoring system, like the SCAT for the concussion and all these things. Huh? Um, iron supply, big issue at altitude. Um, you all know that you need iron to, to, to make red cells. That's, that's nothing new. And in the context of altitude, uh, of, of, of mountain sickness, there's some emerging evidence that iron might also play a role in the development of, of, of acute mountain sickness, 
Again, I choose this to show you that it's all interconnected and there's not one adaptation that you can see without or that you will get without other ones. So in this study, they found out that the change in the AMS score, which is basically the score that I, that I just showed you, this Lake Louise score, um, coming from sea level going to altitude was reduced in people who had an iron infusion before going to altitude and were therefore iron, fully iron um, equipped. Uh, so this is just a preliminary study, but it a little bit paves the way for, to see that it's not as simple as we might think it is. Huh? The chronic mountain sickness, that's uh, a, a disease that you get when you stay at altitude for a long time and um, is mainly caused by increased red cell mass, the viscosity and the, uh, thereby a, 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 a impaired ventilation perfusion mismatch in the lung. Uh, so the symptoms um, are vague as well. Um, the only, only uh, possibility to, go to, to treat it is to go down and to have a phlebotomy. Um, to give you an idea of, of, what, uh, of how far it gets with the red cell mass increase, because we had this discussion yesterday on how much red cell mass you can actually get, you know, is it limited, is it not? Um, there's been studies in mine workers in, in Chile who showed hemoglobin values, uh, hematocrit values of up, up to 91. You know, so 50 means half of your, of your volume is, is red cells and the other half is fluids. And you can imagine that 91, that's not blood anymore, that's basically probably like something like jam in your, in your veins. <laughs> and these people are still alive, you know, and uh, this is published in The Lancet, so it's not like the, some, some, some old paper. So there is, there's quite some margin for our athletes, you know, to, to, to still be, um, to adapt their red cell system. Whether this is good for performance, I don't know. Huh? All right. Two other, uh, two most common uh, diseases, high altitude pulmonary edema, high, pulmon uh, high altitude cerebral edema, those very, very often seen in climbers and, and mountain ex expeditions, um, different uh, symptoms related to either respiratory or cognitive uh, uh, behavior in the, in, in the subjects, but usually only occurs at altitudes higher than 2,500 meters, so not very common and not very likely in the athletes that we, that we take to, to for, for altitude training. Different types of treatment, I'm not going to go into the details. So to sum it all up, I think, uh, from a medical point of view, I think altitude is a drug. And I really like that model made by, by Randy Wilbur, who basically sums it up as altitude being, being a drug with an effective dose and a lethal dose. So this is basically the negative effects and this is the positive effects. And there's a certain therapeutic range where you will profit from altitude and where your adaptations will profit from altitude. And I'd like to, to elaborate on that model um, that both the efficiency and the therapeutic range are highly influenced by individual and environmental factors, training, injuries, illness, nutrition, sleep, and so on. So that's an individual thing. Just like any drug, you have, need to have the right indication and the right dosage for your patient. If the patient doesn't have the right disease, the drug won't, won't treat it. Okay, so to summarize it all up, um, f the physiological system that I've shown you interactively, and I think that's the key word here, adapt to altitude. There's a phenotypic versus a genotypic adaptation. Remember the bareheaded goose there and the llama. Um, several environmental factors can trigger medical problems, humidity, Acute mountain sickness, very often seen in, in athletes. Uh, chronic mountain sickness and pulmonary and cerebral edema, not so common. And as I just said, altitude is a drug with effects and side effects. Thank you very much.